Yeah. Yeah. Patricia Gibson. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I am deeply honoured to participate in this debate on an issue which could not be closer to my heart. I am grateful to the cross-party group on baby loss for bringing this forward. As we have heard, the loss of a baby is what every parent dreads. And those to whom it occurs are irrevocably changed forever, their lives scarred by unspeakable tragedy. A year before I was elected, I had no notion that I would ever have the honour of being elected to represent the good people of North Ayrshire and Arran. But here I am, and because of my own horrific experience of stillbirth, I feel profoundly that I use that experience to help shine a light on this issue, which truly is the last taboo. For too long, too many of those to whom this has happened, understandably, did not feel able did not feel equal to the task of speaking out about this issue. And in turn, those who have no direct experience of this issue simply don't know how to broach it and are very often surprised to find out how prevalent stillbirth is across the UK. Around 3,500 babies each year across the UK and another 3,000 die shortly after birth. To put this into context, That's around one baby baby every hour and a half, the equivalent of 16 jumbo jets crashing every year. It is inconceivable that this should continue. But it will, unless we remove the taboo and shine a light on this awful, awful phenomenon and do all we can for the mums and dads of the future and all the babies yet to be born. It is sobering to think that in the course of this debate, somewhere in the UK, two more little babies will have died, two families destroyed. It doesn't bear thinking about it, about, but think about it, we must. Yes, it is extremely difficult to talk about this, but we have a duty to all the babies who have been lost and a duty to all those bereaved parents who are struggling to put the pieces of their lives back together. The fact is that in Scotland, 34% of stillbirths are babies at full term of pregnancy, and in England that figure is 33%. This is shocking when you consider that medics at all levels will tell you that barring some terrible freak accident, no baby who has survived a full pregnancy need die. Not if the proper monitoring and procedures are in place. And yet, such babies do die. In Scotland, some progress has been made in recent years to reduce the incidence of stillbirth, but we still do not compare favourably with our European neighbours. We still, across the UK, have a long way to go. I know, as many, many others do, the horror of losing a baby. My baby Kenneth would have been seven years old this Saturday, the very day when we reached the culmination of Baby Loss Awareness Week. International Pregnancy and Infant Loss Awareness Day, when we will see a wave of light for all our babies. When children lose their parents, they're called orphans. When a husband loses his wife, he's called a widower. And when a wife loses her husband, she's called a widow. When parents lose their child, there's no name for that. And the reason there's no name for it is because there are no words. It goes against nature. And in other loss of loved ones, all those who knew and loved them can share memories such as the last holiday, the last Christmas, the last important family milestone, but it's not like that with stillbirth. So people understandably don't know what to say. How on earth could they? Sometimes people are so keen to avoid saying the wrong thing that they say nothing at all. And I've heard reports of women after a stillbirth having their neighbours cross the road to avoid speaking to them. Such is the discomfort and anxiety about saying the wrong thing. Because there is no right thing to say. There simply are no words, just a deafening silence and a terrible, terrible sense of being utterly isolated in consuming grief. Like so many parents who have lost their babies, my husband and I are haunted by the loss of how we expected our lives to be after five years of fertility treatment. We are haunted by the potential wiped away so cruelly and so suddenly, so unexpectedly. Haunted by the fact 
that it was completely avoidable, haunted by the fact that all this grief and sense of waste was because the Southern General Hospital in Glasgow, now called the Queen Elizabeth University Hospital, made a series of basic errors, haunted by the fact that this same hospital pulled down the shutters and for six and a half years refused to recognise that any mistakes were made at all, and to this day have still not done so, and haunted by the fact that the same hospital, despite independent experts flatly contradicting them, insist they did nothing wrong. And this matters. It matters because this is an all-too-common story and demonstrates an unwillingness to openly engage in a learning process when mistakes are made. And that shows there is a real culture, a fear even, of improvement if you cannot accept when mistakes are made. How many parents must go through this horrific ordeal to feel swept aside, ignored, dismissed, told that it's just one of those things as they try somehow to cope with the crushing weight of grief. And as we've heard already, bereavement care for parents is simply not good enough. SANS has done very important work in this field and I want to pay tribute to them. They understand the importance of listening to mothers' concerns and they found that of the mothers it surveyed who had undergone a stillbirth, 45% of them felt that something was wrong before problems were diagnosed. Yet too many of these women were told their concerns were unfounded, sent home, only for their babies to die shortly after. Antenatal care must be a collaborative process. Mothers' concerns must be paid attention to. Women know their own bodies. We must have better monitoring of pregnancies, particularly those women at risk of experiencing stillbirth or neonatal death. The truth is, we are failing to identify many babies at risk. And in addition, we must have more knowledge, data and research to help us tackle this issue. The more we know about why our babies are dying, the more measures we can take to mitigate against this happening. And it's very important that if mistakes are made, and remember, one in three stillbirths are full-term babies. Health boards and trust should not be investigating themselves. For investigations to be credible, they have to be independent, carried out by people outside the situation. That's the right and proper thing to do to challenge this culture of secrecy. Where it is believed to be merited, we should, in England, allow coroners to investigate stillbirths so that errors in care can be addressed where they have occurred. And in Scotland, the equivalent would be a fatal accident inquiry. And I know these are not straightforward or easy asks, but such an investment now will mean that as expertise grows and intelligence is gathered, increasingly the need for such measures will necessarily decrease over time. Full of Greenway. Does she also agree that local authorities uh, need to take this into account on registration of deaths? Because I've, I've heard cases of where people have gone to register deaths and obviously the same place where you uh, register births, and that is most upsetting for those parents. Indeed. I take on board what the Honourable Gentleman says is indeed an extremely traumatic experience to register um, the death at the same place where people are registering births. It simply makes the experience much more traumatic. In my own case, my notes recorded that I was asked if I wanted a post-mortem performed on my son. My notes did not record who asked me this question, what information I was given, or when I was asked this question. I was so drowsy on morphine in intensive care since my liver had ruptured after my body tried for 48 hours to deliver my baby naturally and the hospital repeatedly refused to perform a C-section. I have no idea if I ever actually asked what was asked this question. Why was the conversation not properly recorded in my notes? It's all pretty suspicious and it feeds into the sense of cover-up and evasion in hospitals in such circumstances. I'm delighted that we are finally putting this very important issue firmly on the political agenda and that is where it must stay. For those of us in the chamber and those of us outside the chamber, all the grieving parents watching today, it's too late to save our little boys and girls. 
But there are other little boys and girls, other people out there thinking of starting their own families for whom it is not too late. And it is our duty to do all we can to ensure that these little boys and girls enter the world as safely as possible. It is our duty to commit ourselves to this cause for their sakes and for the sake of all the babies who have been lost but will never be forgotten. Yeah. 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 Yeah.